Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so, good afternoon. My name is Christopher Chileshe, and I am the co founder and CTO of Harvest. Harvest is on a mission to solve global food insecurity by accelerating Africa's position as the breadbasket of the world. And effectively, we have a two phase solution for achieving this. The first phase is our marketplace application, which allows farmers to connect directly to B2B and B2C consumers. And as they transact on the application, we start to build an understanding of the market dynamics that exist throughout the continent. We start to basically build a map of the food deserts and the food oasis that exists across the continent. The second phase of our solution is leveraging that same data that's coming from the marketplace to then deploy a network of franchise container farms that then plug the supply gaps identified through the marketplace. At Harvest, we're in the business of making a difference, a lasting change, sustainable impact, creating life-altering opportunities. As we were discussing this presentation as a team, we thought we would come here and talk about how we started Harvest. But we realized that that's not really the story that actually matters. So instead, while you watch the video of our farmers kind of and understanding the revenue growth that they've experienced, we're going to share a different story. A story that I hope will have a lasting impact on you. This story is about Kendi, a mother of two, a farmer from Lusaka, Zambia. Her family owns a farm that grows soya bean and raises pigs. Before harvest, Kendi and her family spent the last year and a half trying to find market for their products. And it was difficult. On October 2022, Kendi joined Harvest as a founding farmer. And I remember because I personally signed her up. And as we sat in Lusaka talking, she was skeptical. She wondered, will this work? And rightfully so. I mean, we had no traction, and we were basically asking her to go by faith. She was skeptical, but she was willing. She started with just five products on her store. And with the backing of a cohort of farmers, she now has over 50 products listed on her store. She went from making 1,000 kwacha per week to 15,000 kwacha per week in just eight weeks of trading on the platform. Her business is booming. She no longer worries about market. Instead, she focuses on her craft. She focuses on what she loves. Instead, she focuses on building her family's legacy. And the really cool thing I love about the story is, although Kendi is a very unique individual, her story actually isn't on the Harvest platform. There are many other farmers just like her experiencing this tremendous growth on the platform. She could be your aunt. She could be your grandmother. She may perhaps even be your own mother. Kendi is you. She is us. Now, the really cool thing about this is uh, we just launched in September 2022. So it's been about five months of trading. And over that past five months, we've experienced an average of over 131% in month-over-month month -month growth in gross mer merchandise volume. That's a mouthful. Basically, we're growing really, really quickly. Um, and overall, we have over 75 Horeca or ho hotel, restaurant, and catering clients that are actively trading on a week-by-week -week basis on our platform. Our GMV as of January 2023 is $100,000 in market spend. 
Our business model is quite simple. Um, we have a land and expand plan, and as I mentioned, we start by establishing our, our brand in the marketplace. So we deploy the marketplace application, we start to collect data, we start to understand the market dynamics, and then we deploy the container farms to follow on and plug the supply gaps that currently exist. Our goal is to expand to six countries in just two years, and our revenue model consists of three different types of revenue streams. The first is a transaction-based revenue, which is derived from our marketplace transactions. And then second, we have two uh, revenue models from our subscription-based um, revenue through the container farms and royalty-based revenue from our container farms as well. The subscription is a fundamentally a fee that the, the container farmers will pay in order for us to service and monitor their containers. And then the royalty is for us to continue to, for them to continue to leverage our brand and harvest to be able to market their products and to build trust with their clients. I'm super, super excited about the container farms because of what it presents. Now, we're in phase one of our current plan. Um, however, we have built a POC that actually um, we were able to, you know, sort of harvest our first fish and harvest our lettuce. Um, it's a simple prototype that contains 2017 vegetable pods for growing and has the capacity to hold 900 tilapia fish fully grown. And of course, it has IoT embedded uh, technology to allow us to monitor and collect a, a bunch of data to understand the performance and optimize the container farm itself. But the thing I'm actually most excited about is our team. Um, we're led by Curtis Madden, who's our CEO, and he comes with 10 years of experience in the food and distribution industry. And then we have Carol Matabiri, who's our, customer chief, our chief customer officer, and she comes with 10 years of experience in the hospitality industry. And then I myself bring my 10 years of experience uh, in big tech and um, finance. And then, of course, we have a wonderful uh, team of ladies who help with account management, supply and demand customer success, and uh, they do an awesome job of doing that and making sure that the voice of our customers is well understood. Today, we're asking for $500,000 to get us to $186,000 in monthly revenue by Q4 of 2024, and an annualized revenue of $1.73 million. And I just want to share kind of, and, and that plan, the use of that, those funds is effectively to actually expand into Kenya first and foremost, and then also grow our existing market share in Zambia. Um, one piece of exciting news I will share with you that we haven't disclosed publicly is we are actually working with Zambia National Commercial Bank, Zanaco, to sign an MOU to provide liquidity into our marketplace. So they'll be providing liquidity directly to our B2B customers, so on the demand side, where that will unlock uh, probably about half of our GMV and allow customers, uh, our customers to be settled in near real time on the, far, on the supply side. So we're super, super excited about that, and we hope that we have some investors who are willing to join us on that journey. Thank you. Christopher, thank you for yes. that. I think the conference should invite you back to do a masterclass in storytelling. Um, that <laughs> thank was you. Excellent. That was thank excellent. you. I'm going to ask my team to join me right next to me on the stage. Well. Um, I, I, I guess my, my, my first question is because I'm actually a really big fan of these systems and I've been researching them for the last four years. So awesome. Love this. Uh, so my, my first question is, I guess, in terms of price of production, such a smaller scale in yep. these environments, like versus building, say, a facility where it's 20, 30 times of mm -hmm. one of those things. Like, what's the price sort of premium you're yep. paying for a small unit? And does that overcome the logistics of transport and all that other as well? Yeah. Can you take me through that a little bit? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, effectively, the unit economics of a container farm is at, at the retail space, right? So if I went to um, Builder's Warehouse, for example, and I got the components off the shelf, it would take about seven to $10,000 to manufacture and produce one of these containers. Now coupled with, uh, and, and we're, the way we modeled this was on the lowest value sort of crop, so lettuce, right? So not great margins. So if I was building my 2000, if I was growing my 2017 um, lettuce heads and also harvesting my tilapia, my 900 tilapia every six months approximately, then the unit economics actually work out really well to cover the debt for a loan that would, um, uh, that would effectively pay for that container farm, as well as generate approximately $12,000 per year in, in profit or revenue for, um, sorry, not profit, not revenue, profit for the container itself. 
Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So just just to confirm that, are you saying that this pays for itself within a year? Is that what you're saying? That? Um, over three years. So we break up, yeah, three to six months, 36 months, sorry. So over three years. And the reason for that is effectively um, we don't want to burden the franchise owner with a huge loan that they have to pay quickly. Okay. But the unit economics allow it to pay over three years and uh, including the interest on it. OK. Um, two questions. Um, so you said you're hoping the, the Produce a fine market, so like they're not thinking about like who's going to buy this after it's, after exactly. it's done. Um, is that is that a business in that element for you guys? Are you like making like revenue from that side of things, or by just again bringing the, the buyers to to this to this producers? No, so our revenue is those three revenue models, just the transactions. So we see it as our responsibility to bring to make the market happen, especially on the B2B side of things, right? So that's a lot of field marketing that takes place. So um, we don't necessarily charge a fee for making the market happen, but we well, charge. I, I, I meant from the buyer side, not the producer side. Are you charging the buyers like you bringing them this? Um, like the B2B businesses themselves? Yeah. Uh, no, just on the transaction fees. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, my second question was going to be around, uh, is this like plain vanilla, like this is what you get, do what you, do what you will, or is there a level of customization per unit, uh, like because you mentioned like again, tilapia and this, what if I yeah. tilapia, I don't want to do tilapia, so I want to do, some, do something that's entirely, so like what, what level of customization comes with this, yeah. more like a, this is what you get, then you just have to just work with it. So we've actually built out um, three SKUs, we worked with uh, um, uh, a mechanical engineer to develop sort of the AutoCAD drawings for this. And really the SKUs are designed around um, off-grid and on-grid availability. So the first is like completely off-grid, then partially on-grid with some solar panels, and then completely uh, on-grid with just electricity um, from you know local municipal. So the completely on-grid is the cheapest model and probably the easiest one to deploy. You just plug into electricity, it runs the generators for fans and things like that within the, the system. Um, but those are the three SKUs that we would start with initially. Uh, and then over time, um, I think we'd add SKUs to that depending on, on what we find. Maybe you might want to have a double unit, for example, um, uh, depending on the location, the size of the container. Does that address the question? I think just to add to that, uh, one of the things that he did mention in the presentation was uh, the, the data that we derive in from the marketplace, which will help us identify exactly where the supply gaps exist. And then because we have that information, we can tell with confidence that there's offtake for tomatoes on that street, um, at, at a street or neighborhood level, and, and be able to tell ex uh, the farmer or the franchise owner exactly what to grow, when, and for how long. How easy has it been to onboard farmers to your platform? And <laughs> yeah. So I think, Carol, you want to take that one? How easy is it to get farms onto the platform? Um, look, it's had its challenges. It's had its challenges in the sense that, um, you know, we're talking tech, right? So it's not second nature to these farmers. However, it has been such an educational process. Now, the main challenge that a lot of farmers have, the first challenge that they have is access to market. So it hasn't been um, difficult selling it to them, and it's been very easy for them to actually now then come on board, um, because at the end of the day, they want to sell their produce, they want to offload their produce. So then just having that guarantee that, okay, the market is there, um, or you just need to just learn how to use this app, basically. So it's been educational on that end, but then the really good thing is that the app is really, really easy to use. So we've got a vendor app, um, that they need to learn how to use, which is very, very simple. It basically allows them to receive orders, accept orders, know what orders they have for the day, send a notification, um, basically um, send, back, send feedback, say, okay, yes, they've delivered the order, and that's it. So it's very easy to use. Um, there's also the web app version of the app, um, which again is very easy. So they've got two options. They can either use the web app or they can use the mobile app, but in most cases, they actually use both. Okay. And how do you ensure that when the farmers who are on the platform get connected to the buyers, they don't just bypass the platform at some point and decide, let's just do that? So. so that's very interesting that you say that, because that was a major concern, right? Um, and at first, we actually had um, the farmers' contact details on the app, listed on the app. Now, one of the key things with our approach is that it's very relationship um, centered, right? So the relationships that we have with our end users, so the, 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 the hotels, the restaurants, etc., 
that's really gold for us, right? So we've built really strong relationships and what's, what's happened in return is that we have had farmers try to bypass and start contacting these restaurants or hotels to try and get um, business outside. Um, and the restaurants have just basically reported it back through because they absolutely love working with Harvest because of the fact that number one, they're guaranteed that we've vetted these farmers. Um, there's a lot of training that we're providing besides just on the tech side from a quality perspective as well. Um, we're providing farmers with you know all this feedback. So prior to onboarding these, or rather when we onboarded these farmers, prior to um, processing some of these orders, what we've done with the restaurants is that we would have found out, okay, what are you currently actually paying for produce right now? So in a lot of the cases, um, the savings that they're making by moving to harvest have been like, what, 40, 50% on average. Um, in some cases, um, you know, you've had, you've had restaurants go from one, one hotel, perfect example, they were spending just over 60,000 per week on fresh produce. Right now they're on about 25,000, right? On the same produce that they were getting before, but then because they're simply buying it directly from the farmer. So then all that has built in terms of their loyalty to Harvest because they see the value of working with Harvest. We're the ones that are communicating with the farmers. We're the ones that are basically negotiating that pricing with them and yet they're still getting a much lower price. And just to supplement to that, there's some uh, natural moats that occur as well. So number one, consolidation of orders, right? They don't have to deal with multiple, even if they're dealing with a single broker, um, they typically have to deal with multiple brokers. And as a fail safe, you get the guarantee that if one farmer isn't available, um, there's backups in the system. Second, um, they can have, they get consolidated invoicing, they get a much, much more automated process that they can work within, um, so they really, really enjoy that. They get the relationship manager that we talked about, um, and of course, um, being able to just consolidate everything through a single platform in a digital format is something that they also kind of become accustomed to and don't want to move away from. So when a farmer attempts to kind of circumvent that, um, they're, they're hurting themselves, yeah. I think just to add to that, lastly, the risk of intermediation, which is what you're referring to, is always something on any platform or, or it's a risk that, that's out there. Um, we've kind of circumvented it a bit by having vendor agreements in place, legal documents, which our vendors sign as a farmer to say that they can't go to any um, business that we introduced them to and, 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 and like kind of bypass the platform. So. Yeah. It's there, uh, you know, how enforceable it is it depends on the law, etc. Like of the land um, as we expand into different territories across Africa. Yeah. Um, it's a quick question on, on, from me. Um, the, you, you spoke about um, as being part of a food security um, process that you, or business that you're wanting to build. Your end clients all appear quite high end, quite, we're talking restaurants, we're talking people we're going to see in Westlands here. Now, there's a significant portion of, of the population that eats at, at Kibandas. They, there are agri co-ops, there are lots of staples that get, none of that's getting provided for here. And how do you plan to tap into that given the powers that the SACOs and the agri co-ops actually have within a market like Kenya? So, if I can um, repeat your question and make sure I understand it. Um, you're asking about um, whether we are able to target lower end customers yeah, on the so, supply so side or on the I'm demand a side? restaurant and I need lemongrass. That's unique. There's, yeah. a, there's a market, I get it, this is it, we're short. <clears throat> but for 90% of the population, it's staples. It's bread, mm. milk, you know, the grains, the... Yeah. How's that brought in here, given the powers of, and the size of the, the staples in, in the market, the, the co-cooperatives? Yeah. So I think um, fundamentally what we're trying to do is um, establish the market with B2B customers on the higher end first because it helps us create a repeatable business that we can kind of scale a little bit better. And then it helps us kind of like trickle that down to, to the lower tier of, of users as well. And I don't mean that in a derogatory term, but just um, uh, lower income maybe is a better term. And so I think effectively, um, in order for the business to make sense and for the economics to make sense, we have to go after the big customers first. Um, and then we can start to service and, um, and build the infrastructure around smaller scale um, consumers of, of, our, of our products. Now, as a function of the marketplace itself, I think the farmers and the suppliers have to understand that on the B2C side, they have to be competitive in the, market, in, in the pricing for that as well. So we don't control pricing. We have our markup that we set and we, you know, we're upfront about that, um, but it's up to the suppliers to say, hey, your market's not gonna get made if you don't price it according to where uh, the market currently is. Yeah. Thanks. And I think to turn on 
that function of of the of the of the, the marketplace, as you as as, as you rightly called it, um, it, it's not difficult once we've established the track record. So we've, this business is about trust. Um, we we've established ourselves in the market as 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 a marketplace where you can get competitively priced produce um, that's reliable, that's consistent. Um, there's a lot of brokers in Zambia, in the Zambian context, I know also from our research in Kenya, it's pretty much the same lay of the land. Um, so when you start moving into kind of commercial staples, your maize, your rice in some regions, um, those are volume-based transactions, which maybe on a, on a little, on, on like an individual transaction don't make sense, but when you aggregate to, to turn that on when you've got the demand and supply data, becomes a lot easier. So it kind of is also a function of time.